but how will I know? Hey everybody, it's Pastor Justin Walker here with The Whole Truth. We're going through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're not skipping anything, and I want you to come along with me. You can do that by following along the page or subscribing to the channel and grab a Bible. That's the most important thing. Grab a Bible because we're reading all the way through the Bible. Open it to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 7 and look at this. And then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. God has been promising Abram. This is twice now that God has promised Abram that he would give him this specific territory of land. It's the promised land. So this is the promised land that he, God is promising to Abram. Well, look at what Abram says in chapter 15 and verse 8. And he said, that's Abram, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Now, God himself just promised Abram something. And Abram says, how will I know? How can I know that I'm going to inherit this land? Now, his question is reasonable. He's old. He's an old man. He's getting older in years. People are not living as long as they've been living in the past. He's not in a time when someone is living 800 or 900 years. They're living a little bit over 100 years, and he's nearing the 100-year mark. And so he knows that his time on earth is growing shorter. And so it's a reasonable question. How will I know that I'm going to inherit this land? Yet at the same time, it was God who just promised Abram this. And I would just say to you this, that many times doubt mars our faith. Abraham believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. That was in just the last video, remember? Abraham believed and God accounted it to him for righteousness. And so we know that Abraham believed. We know that Abraham had faith. And yet here we obviously see that he still had some doubt there. He still struggled. And we see the same thing with John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist who preached and he prophesied and he baptized and he was, he was prophesying, make straight the way of the Lord. But then when he was in prison later in his life, remember what John the Baptist said? He said, to send a messenger and he wanted to know if Jesus really is the Christ. And so we see that oftentimes and in our lives as well, though we have faith, we still struggle with doubt. And I would say to you today that just know that you're not the only one that struggles with doubt, but don't let your doubt lead to disbelief. Abraham believed now, he said, how will I know? Obviously, there's some doubt there, but it's not a disbelief. It's a genuine question. And I would also say to you this, that it's okay to question the Lord, just so long as you're willing to receive his answer. Okay, it's not, do you understand the difference there? It's not okay to question God like you already have an answer. If you're screaming out to God, why did you do this to me? What you're really saying is you shouldn't have done this to me, right? That's not okay. It is okay to say, God, why? Why am I going through this? In a legitimate, like, I want to know, how is this making me better? What am I supposed to learn from this? Now, Abraham says, Lord, how will I know? And look at what God says. He gives him a weird list of stuff. Weird to us. That's what I meant by weird. I don't mean weird for God to say it, but weird in, in the sense of strange to us or different from what we're used to. In chapter 15 and verse 9, so Genesis 15, 9, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Here's your grocery list. Get you a three-year-old heifer. That's not a small cow. Get a three-year-old heifer. Get a three-year-old uh, goat. Get you a... a, a uh, get bring me a, a three-year-old ram and then also get a pigeon and get a turtle dove bring those all to me and look in verse 10 check this out then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed them each uh, piece opposite of the other but he did not cut the birds in two and when the vultures came down on the carcass Abram drove them away now did you notice God said go get these animals but he didn't tell Abram what to do with them he didn't say, go get the animals and cut them in half. He said, go get the animals. And then in verse 9, 
he said, we read this. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, three-year-old goat, a uh, female goat, three-year-old ram, turtle dove, a pigeon, verse 10. And he brought these to him and cut them in two. Abram was already used to this. That's what I'm getting at. Abram was already used to this custom. This was a custom of the day. And you see the same thing in Jeremiah 38 of reference to the same thing. This was a way of signing a contract. In the ancient world, they would take the animals, cut them in two, place them on either side, and then the two people, the two parties together, would walk through together. And there was a, a sentiment there. There was an understanding there. Number one, this was so serious of a contract. That when two people were going to make a contract, they cut an animal in two, put it on either side, and they pass through the middle with an animal, an animal on either side. So one, it's saying the contract is so serious, it's, it's basically being signed in blood. Now, not somebody cutting themselves and signing it with their own blood, but that's how serious the contract is, that, that blood is involved. Number two, it is also symbolizing that if I break the contract, let the same thing happen to me that has happened to this animal. Okay, so God tells Abram, go get these animals. Abram knows exactly what to do. He cuts the animals in half. Now, I know for you and me, that's a strange custom. We're not used to that custom. We, we have paper and we sign paper. But in their day, in the ancient world, this is what people would have understood. Abraham obviously uh, understood what he was doing and he took the animals and he cut them and he put them on either side. But here's where things start to get interesting. These vultures come down and Abram has to shoo them away. Abram is obviously waiting for God in some way to take on human form and come sign this contract. Come pass through these animals. He's, he's chopped them in half. Now he's waiting. He's waiting beside the animals. And look at what happens in verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possession. Now what is God talking about there? First of all, Abram has questioned him and said, Lord, how will I know? Right? He said, Lord, how will I know? Now God is telling him, before I sign this contract, you need to know this, Abram. Your people, the, your descendants. Abram doesn't have any children yet. But Abram, when you do have children, your descendants, they're not immediately going to possess this land. As a matter of fact, they're going to be strangers. They're going to be slaves. And we know that. We see that in the book of Exodus. That's exactly what we see is that the uh, Hebrew people are slaved, enslaved to the Egyptian people. And God prophesied that to Abram. He told him, this is going to happen. Now look at verse 15. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You, Abram, you're not going to... You're not going to be in slavery. You're going to go to your, your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old, at a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Isn't that interesting? The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God is telling Abram, your, your people, your descendants, are first going to be strangers in the land. And then he also tells him, he says, but you, Abram, you're going to die at a good old age. But I'm not going to give you the land just yet. Why am I not going to give you the, the land just yet? Well, number one, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God did not just go in and push out a group of people for no reason. The people that were in the land that we'll see when, when God's people go into the promised land and there's, there's other people there, Canaanite people there, and he has to drive them out, know that those people had been sinning against God. And it was part of God's judgment against them to use the Israelite people to drive them out. And he even tells us that. We'll read that later on as we come to those verses where God will say, don't think yourself something special, Israel. I'm using you to fulfill their punishment, to fulfill their judgment, and drive them out of the land. It's not because you're so great, but it's because of what they've done, and I'm using you to drive them out. God will say that to the Israelite people later in his word. But right now, he's not there yet. He just tells Abram their sin is not yet complete. And what we see again is that God is gracious, and he is merciful towards us. And he does not just, he does not take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. He does not take any pleasure in driving people out of their land or war or bloodshed. That is not what God is doing. So God warns Abram. Abram said, Lord, how will I know this? And God said, well, if you want to know, then you need to know the whole thing. They're going to be slaves first. Then look at this, verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down. Earlier, it was as it was going down, Abram has the vision. Now, it, the sun has completely gone down. 
totally down. Look at this. And when it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made the covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I have given the land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the, Euph the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kedemites, the Hezites, I'm sorry, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now, did you see what just happened? Abram's on the sidelines, and God, in the form of this smoking pot and this torch, God passes through the animals. Now, first of all, the smoking pot, there's reminiscence there. God's seen in the smoke many times. We see God in a pillar of uh, cloud leading the Israelite people later in the Bible. We see that God covers the mountain in smoke or the same thing in the temple, that God covers it in smoke. And so we see also uh, like a pillar of fire. We see God in the fire. Uh, Holy Spirit came down, cloven tongues of fire. Or we see the uh, pillar of fire that led the Israelite people uh, during the night when they couldn't see the cloud. So what we see is that it is God himself represented going through the pieces. It's in the same day that Abraham cut them in half. He didn't wait a week. He didn't wait a month. He cut the animals in half. He placed them on either side. He was waiting for God. God gives him the vision that the, that his people, this, this horrible vision, this awful vision, that his people are going to be enslaved. And then God himself passes through. It wasn't anything to do with Abram. It's, do, do you remember what I told you? And the custom of the day would have been for two people to pass through together. But God signed this contract all by himself. Abram was on the sidelines. This was a promise that God was making to Abram. And God wasn't going to back out on his contract. He wasn't going to back out on the deal because of Abram struggling with his faith or because Abram had doubt, because Abram questioned. And could we rest in this as we close today, that the same is true for you and I. When we believe in Jesus as the Savior, he saves us from all of our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness if we'll confess to him and know this. When you're saved, you are in the Father's hands and no man can pluck you out. You're not hanging on to God. You're not hanging on to his coattail. You're not hanging on by a thread. You're not getting in by the skin of your teeth. It's the covenant that God has made. It's from God to us. And all he asks us to do is put our faith in that. Will you trust him? Notice that God didn't give Abram a, a sign. Rather, he signed the contract. The animals were split and God passed right between them and said, Abram, I've promised you the land and I'm going to do it. And you know what God has promised us? Eternal life in his son Jesus. And he'll be faithful to do it. All right, guys, I hope you'll see, I'll see you tomorrow with Genesis chapter 16.